in this thing that we call life is how do we deal with it? How do we relate who we are as Christians and at the same time recognize that we're still learning, that we still have a process to go through, that there's still things that we don't know but we're applying to our lives as we do know them, that we are being educated or we could say being transformed from we could call it our tadpole ex existence into our bullfrog, or I like to say that we're more like caterpillars. You know, we're kind of crawling around, just snuffling our way, you know, from one leaf to another, chewing on whatever we can find, until one day we just decide to put ourselves in a cocoon, wrap ourselves up in our crystallis, and then God begins that transformation to change us into a butterfly. Because it takes time and it takes effort and it takes a process in order to grow and develop into the person that God wants you to be. In developing that, we have found that many books along the way provide opportunities for us to educate ourselves as well as to learn from the Spirit of God as He applies it to our lives. We know the Bible itself teaches us all about the things that we need for life, but sometimes we need a little more. Sometimes. We like to have some directed studies, some things that apply directly to us, that are tools, like a surgeon would use a scalpel in order to cut you know, the skin more accurately, so it'd be just a nice even cut, rather than a hunting knife, which might you know, have a serrated edge or a jagged cut to the skin. We know that a surgeon's scalpel just cuts only that part that held in the hands of the surgeon could cut just enough depth to cause the skin to be parted and that the surgeon could actually do the surgery in. So tools that we use currently right now in this study we call principles of life because we're taking it from the Basic Youth Conflicts, Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts in their textbook that basically has research in principles of life. Those are those things that we apply to our lives in order to learn and develop the skills that we need not just to be parents or adults but to handle issues both in studying scripture, applying scripture, in learning for ourselves the things that we need for our own personal life. There's often been said that there's no textbook for life, that life comes upon you without a textbook. Well, it's not true. You're given a Bible, you know, and you were given the Word of God, and we're told that inside of the Bible and inside of the Word of God that God has given to every man a certain portion of knowledge that he, even by way of creation itself, can know the Godhead and can see that there is God. And so it's not true that we're not given a certain amount of knowledge and wisdom. We are given that according to scriptures in Romans. So knowing that principle, we know then that no one is innocent, but everyone has taken the image of the incorruptible God and changed him into the image of corruptible man. So that way we know that everyone is without excuse when it comes to dealing with the salvation issue, which is why we became saved, hopefully. If we don't know that, then we realize that there are people out there that aren't saved, that don't operate under certain principles that the Creator has given us since the beginning of creation. And so, knowing that the Creator created us and that He has given us knowledge and that we have responded and we become born again of the Spirit, then we want to move on in life. We want to make it easier to deal with not just ourselves and other people, but to deal with life as we live it. Because once we learn these things, then it becomes so much easier to relate to each other information, to tell each other scripture, teaching, doctrine, dogma, those things that are important to us, and to accurately portray them in a way that is pleasing not only to God, but also the person receiving it is likening to you being like the Son of God, that he wants to hear what you have to say. So we take these principles of life pretty serious, but we try to apply them as best we can based upon the knowledge that's in these books because obviously we could t spend years studying principles of life but we want to go through them as we have already through different portions of it and allow God to apply it to us as best we can allowing his spirit to cause us to hear what he would have for us to learn from it because I can't take you except that I would sit here with a you know you with a uh, table and some food, you know, and some coffee and some bread and some cheese and some wine and, you know, maybe some more food and some sweets, you know, and all these other things. We could sit down and study for days, you know, and eat and read and study and apply and disciple and grow and develop and it would be like, wow, cool. Except we can't do that. <laughs>
Unfortunately, not everyone likes to do it the way I do it. So, you get the video. What we're studying today, and what we're looking at, in Principles of Life, as I said, we're taking it from the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts, and we're taking it from their textbook, but we're applying to it as inspiration, this as a foundation so that we can build our own structure and go from it from there where we will. And today we're talking about building maturity through principles. In other words, oh, I'm sorry, no we're not. We're talking about going, that's not right, tracing problems to the root causes. I really enjoy the book because a lot of times it brings to mind everything that I've learned throughout life. Now, I did want to turn it around and behind my camera that I'm looking at is my bulletin boards, you know, and I have my bulletin board set up and my, my whiteboard, you know, and my two whiteboards, you know, and I'm hoping to get a rolling chalkboard, you know, eventually so that way I could use it for, you know, especially principles of life study because we will be reversing the camera angle and doing that more often as we get materials presented and prepared ahead of time more so than just talking about it. But that's going to happen when we start getting into the basic concepts of principles of life like self-image, responsibility, conscience, rights, uh, freedom, purpose, and friends. Because those are sections. These are all basic principles that we're beginning to go through an introduction that kind of sets you up for the real meat study that we're going to get into. Last week, if case you didn't know or whenever you saw the video last, we were um, talking about principles in applying scripture and how to apply it, you know, working through the text, meditating on the text, and discovering principles in the text, and how that, you know, was appropriate to our study of scripture so that we could learn from that. Now we're tracing problems to the root causes because, you see, according to the Bible, man looks on the outward things, you know, which makes sense because you're not clairvoyant and you don't have ESP. But we are given certain gifts from the Holy Spirit that allow us to be able to do some other unique things that only God can do. And one of those unique things that God does is that He can look on the inside. He can see the attitude of the heart. He can see the actions that a person has done in the past, the actions that a person does in the present, and the actions that the person is going to do in the future. He knows what was, what is, and what is to come. He is always that way, a tripart being, being that He stands outside of town, town outside of time and is able to see the entire personality of that person. So he's able to, based upon his knowledge, foreknowledge and as well as his will and his personality and his character, to make determinations about a person that we can't do. We can only deal with the surface at first unless we are given some kind of wisdom to go beyond that. And that's what we're studying today. How to go beyond dealing with only the surface issues. You know, the surface issues, the things that you see, the things that are spoken to you, the things that are, you know, handled, you know, with your hands. That which I've heard, that which I've seen, that which I've handled with my own hands. You know, another tripart aspect of how God deals with us and how we deal with God. You know, the physical, the mental, or the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, body, soul, and spirit. So, in dealing with these tracing problems to root causes, it gets real interesting. So I would say to you, you know, if you get the opportunity then to automatically plan on each time, sitting down with a piece of paper, you know, jot down notes, because I try to go through this quick because there's so much material. It's only one page, but there's so much material that needs to be said or responded to uh, correctly relating that information that's here within the volume of that experiences that I've had with this, that a lot of times it's easier to write down notes, you know, to jot down little pieces that fit for you, you know, something that connects the dots that somehow it's part of your life. Because I have no idea what you've gone through, but I know what I've gone through in regards to this and how dealing with those aspects. I studied um, at one time very in depth for quite a few, oh, I would say, uh, textbooks or teachers, whatever. It used to be called care confrontation. It was the ability to present and relate to a person in a confrontational way through the medium of caring, not through the confrontation of creating hostility, anger, wrath, malice, or defensiveness or anything else, but through care confrontation, bringing a caring concern to undergird that person to bring out of them that which we were able to minister to that person in their need, whether it be emotional, physical, mental, um, spiritual, religious, you know, whatever aspect of it that it might have been that that person would reveal as you were able to caringly confront them, you know, some situation, whatever it may be that they were in. 
And it was a fascinating study, and it applies directly to this principles of life because both contain wisdoms and nuggets that we were relating in these studies. <coughs> As we do this, God alone is our teacher, so he inspires that with which is being said, and he conspires within my heart to present it in a way that you would understand it. So according to your way and will, you need to inspire or work with God to cause you to be inspired to hear what it is that you really need in your life for principles to apply to your life so that you would learn thereof. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time watching a video because it's just intellectual stimulation that goes, oh, that's interesting. No, we're here because we want to apply it to our life. These are real life given situations that sometimes involve life and death of a person, not just spiritually, but also physically. And not just physically, but also permanently as far as eternity is concerned. So we take this subject really serious. When we deal with tracing problems to the root causes, you start off from our point of view. Now, once you've learned it, you can start off from a different point of view. But to start with, you just look at the surface problem. You can only deal with what you see what you hear and what you understand or what you perceive with your hands, what you're literally dealing with as you come into contact with that person. And what it says, basically, we'll just read it and then we'll discuss it. Surface problems. These problems are visible to other people. Sometimes it is clear what the deeper problems are, and sometimes the visible manifestation is very deceiving. We often say that you can't judge a book by its cover. The book is red. The pages are black and white. Now, judging the book by its cover, we could say that the pages are red, because after all, the cover is red. But obviously, it's not. So that means that you can't judge everything by the surface. But it could be that there are pages that are red. And if we look through it, we would have to go all the way through it to find out whether or not there were red pages in it. And there isn't. But if I marked a marking pin in it, then there would be. <laughs> so you don't just judge a book by its cover or by the way it's designed. You judge it by what you see, what you come into contact with, and what you apply as you're dealing with it at that moment. So a lot of times in dealing with these surface problems, what may be true with one surface issue at some point in time may not be true the next time you run into it. Sometimes it's variable dependent upon the way that the Holy Spirit's going to inspire you. So you have to be careful of that to make anything fit into a box too much so that you make it a law, a dogma, a doctrine, or something that you dogmatically, automatically think that you can do every time that you run into a problem. You can't. Every situation is unique and distinctive unto itself. It is according to what God's wisdom is at that moment of how he wants to use that. Because he may even tell you what the problem is, but he may not want you to solve it. See, it's not always as simple as it seems. The same way is true about problems. When it is a super simple issue on the surface, there may be underlying causes that we haven't you know, discussed yet, and we'll get into those. A surface problem could be a resulting illness or wrong priorities, a financial problem, um, lying, stealing, cheating, or arguing. These are all surface problems. Let's take them one by one. Resulting illnesses. A lot of illness, whether you know it or not, is caused by surface issues, by stresses by outside influences causing people to either by psychosomatic and psychosomatic doesn't always mean something that's made up but it means you cause the mind to create in you something that's wrong something that causes the body to react in a negative way so it's not just imagination sometimes it's a matter of we could put it in spiritual terms by saying it's a physical faith of the mind being exercised to cause the body to do an unhealthy response to itself. One of the autoimmune deficiency, uh, what autoimmune diseases is the simply idea that the mind and the body are at war with each other. The mind will say to the body that there's some foreign object inside the body that actually is healthy tissue and it will cause it to attack itself. That is an idea of there being a resulting illness of a surface issue that something else is causing that from an external source. And that external source is the mind, but it's being provoked by something else, and we know that. Nobody just sits around and says, I want to be sick. Of course not. As a matter of fact, the body automatically tries to heal itself irregardless of what we do. That's called a auto-responsive um, <laughs> Good question. I can't remember the, the medical term anymore. 
It's a, it's a basic function of the body that it will repair itself, it will heal itself, it will try to always take care of itself. It's something that God placed in the physical form that it will always deal with. Another surface problem would be wrong priorities. You know, what are you dealing with? You know, why are you, you know, like out partying when you should be working? Why are you working when you should be out partying? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's just not serious. But priorities are simply those things that when we say wrong priorities, you have to have a standard with which to judge those by. A wrong priority at one moment may not be a wrong priority later. Like so let's just say that you should be at work, you know, on Monday through Friday, but you're off on weekends, so you go, you know, enjoy yourself. Well a wrong priority would be to say, okay, well, I'm going to go out and party on Sunday night all night long, and then I'm going to show up for work on Monday. That's a wrong priority because, while well, at the time, yes, you have the freedom to choose to do what you want on a Sunday night, you know that your priorities to work override that freedom you have on Sunday night because you should be prepared for work to do your job the best of your abilities. So obviously that's a wrong priority. Setting wrong priorities can also be like not going to church, not reading your Bible, not praying, all kinds of things. It can be a wrong priority to say um, you're going to play on the internet instead of you know have time with your family. You're going to watch TV instead of communicate with your children. You're going to give them a, a uh, Xbox instead of playing with them outside. You know, there's a lot of things that are wrong priorities that by themselves aren't necessarily an issue. For instance, like an Xbox, you could limit the time that you spend on it and still spend time outside. Um, television, you could limit that time spent so that you still have time to spend with your family and communication and cooperation, working together cohesively as a family unit rather than just being a bunch of people sitting around a television and just occupying the space while a television is broadcasting what it wants to to you while your mind takes it in and you're brainwashed by it. And you are brainwashed by television. Everybody is. It's not negative or positive. It's just a fact. The same thing could be true of any other priority, whether you decide to pray or not pray, read your Bible, not read your Bible. Obviously, a priority of reading your Bible causes a good effect if you read it because you're told to. The scriptures tell you that these are principles of spiritual life that you need to apply so that you could change your physical life and your emotional life by having a foundation of solid teaching and word inside you that God would accomplish his purpose according to what he said he would do through his written word as it's being read by you daily as you're seeking him allowing his spirit to work in you. Those would be wrong priorities. So. A lot of these are just issues that on the surface look like you can solve them, but there might be something else beneath it that's causing you not to read. Why didn't why don't you want to read? Maybe you're dys dyslexic, you know, and you can't read. Maybe you don't have a reading skill level set for the Bible you're reading. I mean, there's lots of issues that again, we're just trying to identify right now on the surface just the issues themselves. The visible results of inward conflicts is what we're talking about. All of these issues that I'm mentioning now are just the consequence. They're not the actual problem. The problems beneath it, the consequence of it is on the surface that we see. The things like stealing, cheating, arguing, those aren't the problem. Those are the consequence of the problem. There's something else that's causing you to cheat, to lie, to steal, to argue. Why are you arguing? You don't know why. Because you haven't dealt with the root of it. You haven't dealt with what's underneath it. You know, are you, you know, I don't want to get into it ahead of the schedule of what's on this book, but, you know, are you an argumentative person? Well, you know, you can learn to deal with it in a different way. But the point is, is that we're dealing with all these surface issues. Remember, these are just on the surface. There's something causing this to happen. Why is there illness? Why is there wrong priorities? Why is there financial problems? Why is there lying? Why is there stealing? Why is there cheating? Why is there arguing? Why is there adultery? I mean, you could go through the whole list of negative things and you can make your own list. So I would say stop what you're doing, sit back and think about it. Because here's a scripture that I want you to look up and to apply, you know, and then think about and then make your own list and then kind of realize these are the surface issues. These aren't what's causing the problem. These are things that you're dealing with, but they're kind of like the symptoms. You know how you have a headache? Well, the headache came from something. You know, maybe you're stressed out. Maybe you've got you know, any number of diseases going on inside your body that's causing a lack of oxygen to go to your brain because it's constricting the, the blood cells that are supposed to be going freely through, you know, your arteries to your brain, but your arteries are carotid because you've got so much calcium and plaque and 
you know, junk and gunk, <laughs> but I can't think of a word, I'll make one up, you know, inside your arteries that you, you know, you haven't lived a healthy lifestyle, so it's caused this thing to happen, now you get regular headaches, because you're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. So, you know, some people say, well, take a thinner, you know, like a aspirin, because it thins the blood. It doesn't take away the problem, you still got arteries that are clogged. You see what I'm saying? So there's still a root problem. Sometimes people put a band-aid over what the actual issue is. And so, the scripture teaches us on the surface issues that from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? James 4.1. See, according to James, we're getting into some really blunt facts. Whenever you deal with the book James, <laughs> Whenever you put the word James there, it's kind of like Jacob, you know. Jacob, we always treat him as kind of like a character. Well, in some ways he was. In some ways he probably wasn't as bad as everybody makes him out to be. But we use him in that typology in order to say that he kind of warred against himself and against God at times, wrestling back and forth. We call him the supplanter and the wrestler and, you know, the man who had two names. You know, when he was Jacob, he was a conniver. When he was Israel, he was governed by God. You know, it's kind of like this dual personality type. Well, that's what James is saying. How can there be wars and fightings among you? That's what he's trying to say. James is saying to the church, how can there even possibly be a war if you're a Christian? Now, this could bring up to you some issues about violence and some issues you don't want to talk about. You know, like, if you're a violent person, then you're going to find that in principles of life, you're going to come into some conflicts with what Jesus said. That may be an issue you need to wrestle with and deal with, and we could talk about it some other time, because it's a deep subject, this whole idea of, are you a fighter or a martyr? Which is it that Jesus was, and what do you want to be? The soldiers that were alive in the Roman era centuries that watched Jesus die, gave up their Roman citizenship in order to die like Jesus did without resistance. They chose to be a martyr when they would start it off as a warrior. You see, it's not always about defending your rights and standing up as a witness, you say, to be a Christian killer based upon your country and saying that you're a soldier and that you're to be honored. God doesn't necessarily look at it that way. God says, look, I died for the whole world. Now what are you telling me you're doing? Killing in the name of God? That doesn't work that way. So you see, there's underlying issues that may be causing conflicts that you don't know about. So. James is asking, how did wars come about? How did you how do wars come about? How are wars in your mentality? He's saying, how does fightings come into your mentality? How are you fighting against you know your brethren or much less anybody else? Where did that come from? I remember James was the brother of Jesus. So it gets real interesting when you start recognizing who's saying this. Come they not hence, or don't you realize that this is how wars come and how fightings come? From your lusts? Literally. Lust. So, whatever you're doing when it comes to war and fighting, it really starts off from lust. It starts off from the flesh. It's in the flesh. It's part of the flesh. It's something that you have to participate in in order to do. That where that war in your members. Literally, your, your warring in your members is the whole concept that you're a three-part being. Your body, your soul, and your spirit. Now, your spirit has been already given you by the Spirit of God, so it's holy. So you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But I would like you to think of it as not the temple, because the temple is kind of a bad word to be using, because everybody looks at the temple and says, oh, well, it's such a beautiful building and ornate and structured and everything else. Well, it's just an artifice. It really was meant to be the tabernacle, which had dead badger skins on the outside, because what was important was on the inside, not the outside. And unfortunately, people in Gentile culture, you know, and in non-Jewish culture, will take, you know, great looks and appearances and say, well, that's God because of the outward appearance of a church, where the reality of the church is the people that are in it, not the building itself, the edifice. So this war in your members that James is talking about is how, in your body itself, your physical flesh, you war against what your nature spiritually would be to be peaceful, loving, joyful, meek, kind, temperate, gentle. Now, the members that are of the flesh are rather obvious. Violent, aggressive, abusive, assertive, prideful, lustful. Gets pretty nasty pretty quick and you can figure out real fast which is of the spirit and which is of the flesh 
and they war directly opposite each other. If you make a list and you put down spirit, flesh, and then list everything that the Bible says is fleshy, and you can look it up in a concordance and you can do a Google search, you can do a concordance search, you can do any kind of Bible search, a, a smart Bible will tell you, a smart phone will tell you, um, your pastor maybe, you know, you just ask him on one side. Don't ask him the whole issue, just tell him, you know, you just want to know what the flesh is. What are the lusty flesh things, you know, what are acts of the flesh? And he'll list for them all, you know, and you can talk to him and you can study for yourself. You can do whatever you want to, to put down a list of that. List them all down, write them all down, and then see if that fits into really some vocations that you understand of what they are. Because you can't tell me that when you go to war you're at peace. No, I'm sorry, you're there for a reason. The job of war is to kill. That's it. To commit murder in the name of God, or the name of country, or the name of ideology, or theology, or whatever you want to call it. You know, For some reason, it's murder of some type because you're murdering the flesh. Killing something in order to accomplish a goal. That's murder. Sorry, but it is. Doesn't matter how it might have been in the Old Testament because we could explain that at some other time if you wanted to get into this topic about war. But the point is, is that the war with the flesh that you have now is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, high places. So your flesh itself is being manipulated to get you into thinking wrong ways, to directing yourself into flesh actions. So you're dealing with the surface and you try to solve it with surface solutions. See how that works? The reality is, is that it's a spiritual issue. You're still dealing on the surface if you think that you fight fire with fire. If you think you take violence with violence, if you think you shoot someone because you got shot at, if you respond, you know, aggressively for aggression, you know, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. That's not how we do principles of life. That's not how we live a life that is cooperating with the Spirit of God in us or according to the scriptures as Jesus laid it out to us and has taught us by his principles that he's laid down in the Sermon on the Mount. So James 4 says, how can this be? And he's talking about just the surface problems. So we pretty much wrapped up all of the surface problems on what we do normally. You know, there's the whole idea of fight or flight. You know, that's psychology. Psychology itself is a surface science. It is a surface issue science that only deals with surface realities. It will not go into the spiritual side of man. It only deals with the psychology, psychosis, and the understanding of the mental processes that a man deals with in relating to his superficial or surface world. So you're dealing only in the physical aspects of the mental adaptive processes with which a person coordinates his actions and his attitudes to society at large. And that's what psychology is. So a psychologist only deals with surface issues. A physiologist, same thing. A doctor of medicine does the same thing. He's dealing with surface issues, not the core reason. See the problem here? You're only dealing with one aspect. And that's just the surface problem, but not what's underneath it. And that's where we have to get to. So the next one that we're talking about is what are the surface causes of the surface problems? You see, everything that's up here that you're dealing with out here, that's, you know, like out here, you know, like your attitude, the way you talk, the way you look, the way you treat yourself, the way you respond to people, the way you respond to stress, the way that you react, the way you act, the way you think, the way you participate in things, the way you deal with stresses, those are surface problems in that so far as if they do not have a underlying core that is positive, they become a problem very quickly and you'll see that they do every time. They will develop into a problem. Whether through bad actions, bad reactions, or bad, you know, surface eventual results of the consequences of what you have done and become in that surface persona that you have. So we need to get to the surface causes of what really creates these things. And so these problems are experienced within the emotions and feelings. In other words, <laughs> okay. These problems are experienced within the emotions and feelings. In other words, everything stems from the soul. You see, that's kind of like the middle place where you're kind of at. You're kind of like a soulful person. You have feelings. You do, whether you know it or not. You may say feelings and then try to hide them, confine them, uh, direct them as being masculine or feminine, try to creating them effeminate or dominant or recessive or to be 
assertive or dominant, assertive, assertive or assertive or self-abasing. But the point of it all is there's still emotions. It's a soulful reaction to either a surface input or a spiritual input. You see, you have two different inputs coming in from two different sides into your soul. Your soul is that place where you're dealing with it emotionally. You may not be dealing with it mentally. You'll be dealing with it by your feelings. And your feelings often are connected sometimes to either fruits of the spirit, like peace, love, and joy, or they're connected to dominant feelings you have in your flesh, like anger or lust or lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Pride is a very big one that kind of is tricky because it's a fleshy feeling that goes into the soul, but it's also kind of a negative aspect of a spiritual problem that's going on, which is one of uh, the will. And the will is kind of like the overriding mental process that covers both the spirit, soul, and body. It's whether you have your will or his will be done. And your will will dominate all three. So it's kind of an interesting thing when you play with this and you start thinking of it that way, to separate yourself into this person that has three parts. Are you, you know, fleshy? Are you soulful or emotional? Are you spiritual? So you kind of need to keep that column going and say, okay, well, let's put down in our column, you know, all those things that we said were the problems, you know, what we said was flesh and surface, you know, and that's your flesh. Now we need that center column, you know, the soul. You need to put down all the emotions that you possibly have. See, a lot of things of what you have for emotions, when you put them in that center column, will come from your column on the right. We could call that your flesh column. And yes, you'll have anger. That's an emotion. You'll have depression. That's an emotion. You'll have lust. That's an emotion. You'll have satisfaction. That's an emotion. But you'll also have peace. That's an emotion. So you put that in there. You have joy. That's an emotion. You put that. You have love. You put that in there. Now, peace, love, and joy come from the left column that we haven't gotten into, the spirit, because they're fruits of the spirit. But they do have emotional effect. But we want to put them in the center column because they are emotions. Now, as you put all these emotions down through your column, you'll be putting arrows of which side they came from. Do they come from the flesh or do they come from the spirit? And it's kind of a good exercise for you to just begin to look at yourself in a different kind of way to just do that. Make a whole long list of every emotion you can think of. You can Google it. <laughs> and if you just put Google emotions, and I'm sure they're going to come up with 10,000 different emotions that there are, maybe even different multiple categories of emotions that I never thought of, you know, and I think of a lot of them, you know, but when you hit 490, then, you know, you can stop. <laughs> so we'll just leave it at that and just play goofy with that one, you know, for a little while let you think about 490 emotions or ramifications of emotions. There's actually 70, and then 70 times 7 would be 7 aspects of each emotion that would branch off into their different categories. So there probably are 70 emotions, or 7 basic emotions, and then 70 aspects of them. So it goes either way. You could play off either one, because both have been defined in both different ways. 7 aspects of emotions, or 7 basic emotions, branching off each one of them 70 times. You know, Or you could take it as 70 emotions, branching off 7 times from each one of those categories. It works out. It boils down to about 490. But that's just something that I study. <laughs> Where? Well, we'll get there someday. So, getting into these surface causes, some of the surface causes are, you know, we talked about illness, wrong priorities, financial problems, lying, cheating, stealing, surface, you know, problems. Now, the surface causes of some of those are insecurity, worry, anger, envy, jealousy, tension. The inward results of building our lives and affections around that which is only temporal. Temporary. It's kind of interesting is that, I like to say it this way, you know, when we're talking about surface causes, you know, we're, again, we're in the soul, we're talking about emotions, we often, they're not revealed to others or are not revealed in confusing ways. A lot of times people don't know how to look at emotions because they can be mixed. It, it's like a mixed drink, you know, you could have depression mixed with anger, you know, in some ways because they can be kind of like confused. You could be like, well... 10% depressed and 90% angry. <laughs> you could have a cocktail of emotions. You know, they're kind of like all mixed up and going on. And that's kind of why psychologists and psychiatrists work together, you know, in psychoanalysis. 
you know, or psycho psychoanalysis is that they try to get people to identify the emotions, but then they also will recognize that you can't really identify the emotions, just what the emotion is feeling at the person's time that they relate it to you. And so it changes immediately. I learned a very interesting thing, a shortcut to all of this. You know, I just said, well, wait a minute. Emotions, and this is how I kind of treat all of my solutions, really, with God and my solutions to uh, conflicts and principles of life, is that I was told that love was a feeling and that if I love something, how could I one minute be, well, I should say depressed. How could one minute I be depressed you know, and sad and everything and the next minute I get news that you know, I just won the lottery and suddenly I'm joyful? Where did the emotion go? You see, I figured out very young that these emotions were able to be changed instantly, immediately. There are ways to do that. There are opportunities. Somehow, that input of getting a notification that, you know, one minute the doctor walks in and says, you're dying of cancer and you're all depressed and wiped out, you know, and you're getting all miserable. And next minute he comes in and says, oh, sorry, the test was wrong, you're cured. Wow, you're exalted, you know, you're happy. Where did the emotion go? You see what I mean? It doesn't like just, you know, if it felt so real, how could it disappear? Where did it go? So I began to realize that emotions were a matter of choice. And then I began to, as I learned later in scripture, the choice was to participate in the flesh or participate in the spirit. So I could choose which way I was going by my own choice, by assertiveness of my will in Jesus, that I could choose the direction or the reaction of my own personality. And I like that because, you know, I used to, I tell my wife this and she doesn't like it, but she agrees with it now, sort of, you know, and she, maybe someday she'll understand it. But I told her, look, I don't love you because I love you. I love you because I choose to. And she thinks that's, you know, like like most people would, when they first say it, sounds pretty cold-hearted and not like love. But God so loved the world that he chose to, you know, come and die for the world. You know, I mean, that's what he did. He chose to. That's how love is demonstrated, by its choice, not by its feelings. So that's why I said to my wife, you know, I said, I choose to love you. And when I explained it to her, she, you know, puts up with it. <laughs> Because she is emotional. I mean, come on, let's be real. You know, she's, she wants the emotion of it, too, you know. So, yeah, I have the emotion of it because I choose to. You know, I can choose to participate in that soulful part of it and have the fruit of it, you know, be made manifest and demonstrated through my life. But a lot of times when we're talking about surface causes of what makes people do these surface problems, again, insecurity is a big one. The majority of people are very insecure. They're insecure about their, their themselves. They're insecure about their personality or their life where they come from, where they're going, they're insecure about their health, they're insecure about their wealth, they're insecure. I mean, insecurity is probably one of the biggest aspects that most people hide rather than admit. And God wants us to be transparent. When you get into discipleship, it's very obvious to teachers who's insecure, you know, and who's not, you know. I mean, usually the loudmouth isn't necessarily the one that's confident, but he's usually the most insecure. You'd be surprised how that works. Worry, anger, envy, you know, jealousy, strife. These inward results of building our lives and affections around that which is only temporary. In other words, it's kind of still like looking at only the momentary action or reaction to some kind of input. So the scripture that we have for that is First Timothy six nine. So you should look up and study these scriptures both in you know the beginning of it and the end of it and you know kind of like in between you know, read it. But they that desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and unto many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. The idea behind that is that you fall into a snare when you get into these feelings and emotions because it's like a trap just waiting to, you know, clamp down on you. As soon as you get in into it, you're going to get trapped by it because you've not been able to deal with it, first of all, by choice. You dealt with it by wanting it and getting into it by way of uh, improper way, coming at it from the outward external source, meaning the flesh. If something stimulates you, then you have the opportunity to participate in it. If it stimulated you in a lustful way, then you're participating in what? Lust. So whatever you think you're going to get out of that lustful thought or lustful idea isn't going to work out in the end because it's going to prove to be other aspects of it in your soul are going to cause emotional responses. 
So you see there's surface causes to every one of these issues. And you could talk about them, you know, every single emotion like we listed. I told you to put down in the soul and the spirit. And you could go through each every one of them and figure it out. We're not going to do that in this portion because this is an introduction to self-image and all the other things that will cover that in the later sections of the scripture when we actually sections of the principles of life when we get into in depth. Remember, this is still topical. This is still like introductory, just kind of overview of that which we're going to get in depth on. <laughs> and you thought you were already in depth. Now, the root problems is interesting because the root problems begin to get to where we're talking about what did stimulate this initially, the fact of it. These problems are actually at the source of multitudes of surface problems and surface causes. What causes that problem and what causes that surface cause is when these are solved, many surface problems and causes are resolved. In other words, if you deal with these root problems, you'll usually resolve most of the problems above it, so to speak, you know, the plan. You could say you're pulling out a root. And that's why we call it root causes and we call it root problems. Because the problem, if you could get rid of the root of it, you know, will begin to eliminate most of what the surface issues are. And then people think it's solved, where really there's still one last one, the root cause, what caused it in the first place. So the root problems are greed for money and possessions. Wow. That was pretty simple, wasn't it? Believing that a man's life consists in the things which he possesses. Bottom line, women think that, you know, beauty, children, family, home, love, support, these things that are external inputs will cause them to be accepted and eliminate their insecurity and cause them to you know not have problems in their life you know and those are surface issues those aren't the reality unfortunately so it is greed for money and possessions men are typical of money you know they like mammon they like the things that money gets they like to get money they like power they like to do those things that accumulate those things and that's not where it began you see in the beginning we didn't have money when did commerce begin that's an interesting study that you should check into because a lot of people like to say that free enterprise is a great issue. No, it's not. That's not the reality of what God has said. Free enterprise is simply the idea of man trying to solve on the surface issues that he's dealing with that he couldn't cooperatively deal with on a personal level because he won't share what he has. He's selfish in nature. So commerce is actually the selfishness of man manifested through the interaction of a uh, medium of exchange that we call commerce. It's greed. <laughs> Bottom line. And it, just like the movie said, greed is good. Well, no, it's not. Only God is good. Greed is that physical flesh that's wanting to satisfy itself in a manifestation with which it can get it and then satisfy its own need. So, the scripture that applies to it is from 1 Timothy 6.10 and there's two. The first one is the love of money is a root of all evil or the root of all evil so it is a root issue money always has been money always will be money is the problem mammon is the action of money being made manifest in the societal norms that we put our money into it and as most Jewish uh, proverbs say follow the money you know and you follow the source you know and the Sin usually is found with the money. You know, it's not something that happens. You know, in poverty, although poverty can cause, but the lack of money is also again the root of all evil. So that's why a man would get into stealing. You know, and it would be the same thing. It's still money. You have to kind of deal with it a little bit and look at more of it than just money and possessions. But you know that it's true because you can study yourself and find it in yourself. Again, even though it is a root problem, it's still, as you know, in the flesh. The other scripture that's given for that is Proverbs 28:22. He that hastens to be rich has an evil eye, and considers not the poverty shall come upon him. Everyone in our society in America today basically has the idea that you know you're supposed to be rich, and no one takes the idea that you're blessed if you're poor, because they think it only applies to poor in spirit. No, it's poor in spirit in Matthew. It's poor in Luke. Both apply. It is as it is, the way it is, the way it's written. The scriptures are true and accurate according to the way that they were given and inspired and written to us. And so there is a blessing in poverty. I know I enjoyed it. You know, I personally think, hey man, I dig it. You know, talk about freedom. Ooh yeah. <laughs> 
but I've seen a lot of rich people that are happy but bound up. You know, they're they're happy but they're not joyful. You're not as joyful as they could be. You know, and they talk about it themselves. So if you ever want to know the truth, ask a rich man. You know where he's at. Watch him when he's depressed. You know, get a chance to kind of be his friend and then watch when he's depressed what the problems are. They'll share with you. Believe me. I know I've worked for a lot of wealthy people at different times in my life. And every one of them was always the same. When they needed a friend, they called me because I was the Christian. I listened. I cared. And they knew that I didn't care about their money. <laughs> you know, that was the last thing, you know. Other than that, they were insecure because of their money. And that's because they couldn't trust a friendship that was genuine and valid and real because of money. Bottom line, the root of all evil is the love of money. Or, you know, money, you could say. He that hastens to be rich has an evil eye. You know, it's just, it's one of those things that if you're trying to, if you want to be wealthy, you know, you might as well talk to God about it now. Because it's easier for a rich man to, you know, enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, right? Or is it the other way around? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into heaven. So you see, it really is a problem. And that's only that God is saying, look, I made you, I know you, I have said it, this is a fact. You can pretend and contend and argue with God about it, but it's a fact. Getting to the last part now. We're finally to the bottom line. This is the bottom of everything, and you know, I've already talked about how it's spiritual and body, so I would say it's really all flesh. So you can if you deal with flesh, you're dealing with the spirit, you know, and you can work on the spirit, guess what? You'll deal with the flesh. So I have a different solution, but this is root causes. What causes the problems, what causes the surface causes, and what causes surface problems? Root causes are these problems are the result of resisting the power of God's grace. Think about that. First of all, most people don't understand grace. <laughs> one reason, you can't buy it. <laughs> so that's one reason they don't understand grace. Two, you can't get it because it's given. So that's really a mystery because they can't figure out how to get it unless it's given, which is only by God deciding to do it because he gives it. So they can't understand how somebody could unconditionally love, much less give grace when someone deserves worse. So they don't understand the concept of grace. Grace is a very confusing issue for most people. So the problems are results of resisting the power of grace because the power of grace will cause people to be humbled. It's like, wow, I really don't deserve to be loved. I really don't deserve to be accepted. I really don't deserve to be forgiven. I really don't deserve all this stuff, but you do it anyways. That's amazing. Some people think that grace somehow can get abused by the power thereof of the flesh manipulating grace in some way to cheapen it or to make it into something it's not. But in reality, the grace will cause that person to change through time. Time is the other aspect that is never mentioned in all these studies, but really a lot of problem solving and issue development and getting to surface problems, causes, problem, root problems and root causes is time. It takes time to get there, time to understand it, time to coordinate it, and then time to heal it. So, knowing that the power of God's grace can save a soul and save us from ourselves, you have to sometimes let grace work in a person's life. You have to sometimes exercise grace to a person. Learn what grace is, and you'll learn why it's the power of grace that people are resisting that causes so many problems in their life. It really is. By the grace of God, we're saved. You know, and that we need to really stick with that as far as our theology is concerned, because otherwise, you are creating a religious generation that no wonder they're screwed up and messed up and confused. Every time the Christendom or the Christian church and religion combined has gone off of grace, they have caused all the problems that are existing in the world today. Literally. Because they are the salt and the light of the world. They are the truth. They are the manifestation of Jesus in the world. So whenever they get off of grace, they screw the world up. The entire world gets screwed up whenever Christianity gets off of the grace of God. This is the power which God gives to follow his principles of life, both temporal and eternal. Grace is the manifestation of that which he can do in anyone. At any point in time, anywhere, any place, everywhere, and in every place. Whenever he chooses, as he chooses, the way he chooses. Refusing to dedicate 
personal rights and possessions to God is part of that problem of not accepting grace. Not accepting the power of grace that God has given everything to us that we need. So what would we be doing with personal possessions when they're not really ours to possess? They're ours to dispossess so we could manifest the grace we've been given to giving someone else the same grace. God doesn't give to us things to possess. He gives us things so that we would release them to him so he could use them to minister to others. Believing that these rights and possessions belong to us and that we have the final right to use them as we choose is false. God owns us, literally. He created us, he gave us freedom of choice, and then once we made that choice to follow him and he put his spirit in us, we gave up possessiveness. We gave up selfishness. We gave up those aspects of the flesh. That's why it's a root cause of everything. Grace. If you know you've been forgiven of everything, you have no problem giving everything away. But when you think that you deserve something, then you know that you've messed up grace in your life. Because you think somehow you deserve to receive grace, and you didn't. That's why it's called grace. You can't deserve it, you can't earn it, you can't get it, you can't buy it, you can't demand it, you can't receive it, you can't do anything except receive it. That's all. And the only way you can receive it is if God gives it. And God can only give it if you ask. Kind of messes up all of our theology when we get into grace because it really covers everything. But it causes every problem in the world too when you don't live by grace. And you don't accept the full aspect of what grace means. The scriptures that we have for that is Luke, 90, Luke 9, 23-25, which is a perfect definition of, <laughs> of my gospel. <laughs> if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it, and what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself? Bottom line, my gospel is that simple. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow Jesus. Following Jesus was simply the whole idea that Jesus loved so much that he gave up his godliness. He gave up everything about being God, if that were possible, which, however it is, we don't know. But we only know that he did, and that he, he came as a man, fully man. Now, he's still God, but we don't understand that part. There's something in that spiritual dimension that still covers the reality of being able to die for the sins of the world and become sin for us so that we can be forgiven. But besides that, he was fully human. So, what that means, we don't know. We only know that fully human means completely human. And that he was able to be so giving of that part of himself that God the Father so loved and amazed by his own son's love for us and willingness to give all that up for us bestowed upon us grace because of that. And because of that, it's so overwhelming that it changes lives. It rearranges spirits. It causes us to come into right relationship with the creator of the universe. The one who actually made us, who could have at any point in time said, toast, and we're done. We are told, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That is the scripture that proves whether you're living in grace or you're fighting grace and how it works in your life. Because the gospel is according to grace. It's not according to things that you have done. It's not according to righteousness. It's not according to his mercy only. But it's according to his plan that this would be the means with which all of our issues, problems, and realities of life would be solved if we could just understand what grace really is. What grace really does. What grace costs God and what grace he was willing to bestow upon us because of what it did do as far as accomplishing its purpose with which God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Without that, grace in your life, you can't solve your life. Everything in principles of life from this point on, you might as well forget if you're not living according to grace. If you're not willing to accept that you don't understand grace and move forward in this book, in this study, and you won't really get anything out of it. You might get some intellectual inter, uh, intellectual understanding and some principles that you might make a doctrine out of or a dogma, and you might go out and become a motivational speaker of some type, and you'll deal with surface, just like the motivational speakers of today do. They only deal with surface issues. They make you feel good about yourself, and then you talk yourself into feeling good about yourself so that you're, you're 
by yourself, you think yourself is so good that you're actually good. And the reality is, no, you're not. That's not the way it works. There's still root issues underneath that you're hiding by making the flesh strong enough to cover all the insecurities, fears, worries, anxieties, and problems that really still exist. But when you get down to the roots, when you stand before a holy God and the root is exposed, as God said he will, he is the revealer of the hearts and intentions and attitudes of man, then you find what really is true about life and why we are so much into these principles of life because God wants you to find he knows what life is because he breathed it into us. He gave us life. And because our life got screwed up, because we screwed up what we were given, life, he gave us grace. Because of grace, we will live eternally. Without grace, you will not. That's how it boils down to, pure and simple. So as a born-again Christian, when you first get saved, yes, you get saved by Jesus in the death and resurrection of the Son of God as he laid down his life for the world. But the way that you exist and live with that, and the way that God accepts you based upon his sacrifice that he's made in the world, and in time, and in eternity, is grace. So, resolve it now. If you need to learn about grace, I can recommend several books, you know, like Gospel of Reading Grace, Chuck Smith, uh, a lot of different teachers, you know, have some very powerful teachings on that. You know, study grace if you don't understand it. But don't go forward unless you've got somewhat of an understanding that grace is what's going to be helping you to solve every issue in your life. Because it's going to boil down to that. You're always going to be confronted with that very root core problem that's deep, buried deep down inside that somehow, you know, every man wrestles with this that you either think you deserve it or you think you deserve better. Somehow, grace doesn't let you get away with that because it'll go right down to that root and tear it out by its very nature. Because until you have absolute self-denial, absolute death on the cross, this flesh will fight against grace every step of the way. So, Father, I pray that you will teach us to learn to live by, walk by, and be manifested of the grace of God that you've given us, that we should no longer live after the flesh or after the spirit or even after the soul. But we should live after you. That you have given us grace for our body, our soul, and our spirit. That you are going to present us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy because the power of grace is going to accomplish the work that you've placed within us by your spirit that you've given us so that you would be changing us from glory to glory into the image of your, in in the image of your Son. From incorruptible to, or from corruptible to incorruptible. So God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you have given us principles that we can live by but also you've given us the means with which we can exist because without it we would have been toast in your sight. We would have already been annihilated by your holiness because without grace we would have presented ourselves in the stupidity of our pride and found ourselves wanting and you would have condemned us to hell. But God, because you have chosen us unto salvation and that we will receive that redemption when Jesus takes us home again, I pray that you will work in our lives to cause grace to be made manifest, that we would be merciful to others. We would extend grace, not just for ourselves, but God, you would make it so real in our lives that we would be giving grace to everyone around us, that we would be those ambassadors of what you have done in us, to us, and through us. So Father, when these principles of life begin to become real, in the person's life that even now is watching or listening or being made, changed, and rearranged, even as I'm being rearranged as I teach this, then God, I pray that you would touch the heart and soul and mind and heal it of all those issues, problems, and consequences of sin in their life, that you would resolve that root issue that seems to dominate every other issue in a person's heart and has to be forgiven. God, forgive us, for we have gone our own way and we have lost our way. But you have given us a way to find the truth. And that truth is setting us free by your grace that you've extended for us. To know your son Jesus every day. To walk with him in a simple way. And to understand him as he's teaching us the way. God, I thank you for Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Cool. That wasn't too long. And that's just the overview. Where do we get into the in-depth stuff? Still got some more introductory stuff. <laughs> <laughs>